An albatross. So, as I was saying earlier, the, uh, our, our goal is to put our citizen science work into context. Ron just breathlessly told you about our uh, seabird, uh, uh, I mean our uh, beach bird survey, one, one of the seven projects we've got going now. And so, Rob will be uh, providing some context talking about the seabirds of, of the Oregon coast. Rob. Okay. Great. Well, thank you about uh, seabirds here in Oregon. And uh, actually, as Philip mentioned, a lot of my work is outside of Oregon. And it's uh, only been in more recent years that I have more localized studies here, other than one of the long-term studies I've been involved with at Equin Ahead with the common bears there. But there are a lot of interesting seabirds along the coast. And so what I want to do is just give you, uh, boy, I guess there's so much to say about them all, of course. And uh, what I maybe just thought I'd just go through a few aspects of a few different species. And then if you have questions along the way, please, um, I'm happy to answer them. And write just maybe a, an opportunity for you just to ask any questions that come to mind about birds or that you've encountered on the coast or also uh, during your speech bird surveys too. Uh, so how many people in here would consider themselves at least recreational birds, that you go out and identify birds. Yeah, great. I think it would be All right. How many of you are pretty new to identifying dead birds? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview on um, birds, at least breeding birds here on the Oregon coast. So this is just a pie chart showing the relative proportions of uh, seabirds that breed along the Oregon coast. And there are over, uh, estimated over maybe 1.4 million, somewhere around there, uh, birds that breed along the coast. And this is data that are collected air, um, from the refuges along the coast by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Oregon Coast National Wildlife Refuge Complex, uh, Roy Lowe and Sean Stevenson and, uh, and others. And they have their office here on site, if you don't know that already. Uh, so this is not from one annual survey, but a collection of a variety of surveys through all many years, actually actually decades of work. Uh, so one thing that it really points out is how many MERS we have. So common MERS are by far the most common uh, breeding bird on the coast, so over half a million of them. The second most common bird on the Oregon coast for breeding is Leech's storm petrel, which um, some of you may have seen out, at, out in the ocean, although you have to go quite a ways off, offshore to see these birds. Um, or maybe if you live by one of their nesting colonies, occasionally they end up on land attracted um, to life on shore. Uh, but generally you don't see them very often. And you don't see them very often on the beach either. But that just puts it into perspective. So there's lots of other species that you're familiar with we'll talk a little bit more about, like pigeon guillemots, tufted puffins. All the, the Caspian terns, all these gulls, the gulls seem so prevalent along the coast, western gulls especially, cormorants, uh, pelagic cormorants, uh, branch cormorants, double-crested cormorants, they're all so ubiquitous along the coast and they seem like they're so abundant. And, and they are, rel but relative to these other two species, when you get, off sh um, when you get offshore, uh, they pale in comparison to the size of the populations of common birds and major storm petrels. So this is a, a map that we summarize some of those uh, colony data for the entire Oregon coast here from Astoria down to Brookings. And just kind of paying attention to the relative sizes of these um, circles. So this is pointing out colonies or colony clusters along the coast, not of any particular species, all birds lumped together. Um, and the largest circles are over 100,000. The smallest tiny circles here are less than 100. So you can see there's a wide range. Yeah. Sorry, I'm having trouble reading the towns. Could you just point out the intensity of the Sure, the yeah. That's the yeah. one thing about the Oregon coast. It's so <coughs> relatively flat, isn't it? There aren't, really pro aren't that real prominent bays or features that we can uh, identify the coastline so well, like you can in other areas like Alaska or Washington. OK, so this is a story here. Right? Uh, right in the middle of the coast is Newport. And then Brookings is down here. So uh, Pacific City, Newport, Yahat, Florence, 
Uh, Cooch Bay is here, Reed Sports here. Okay. Thank you. What's yeah. the big circle? Is that Tillamook? Uh, is that? Yeah. Like right in here? Yeah. Yeah, so this is right off the uh, Three Arch Rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a, a massive mer colony there, right? But that colony actually has declined quite a bit over the decades. Um, so one thing that's pretty unique about this pattern, though, is you see these, these big colonies, big circles that you see are generally MERS, in the case up here at Three Arch Rocks. And then, of course, um, here at Newport, we have the Yukon Head Colony, too. Um, and then a variety of sea stacks that, um, up north of um, Cannon Beach in that area. And then, or just south of Cannon Beach, or oh, sorry, north of Cannon Beach, south of the seaside, like um, Tillamook Rock, et cetera. And then there's also some large colonies down here. And this includes some MERS, but also the uh, large storm petrel colonies. So most of these big circles that you see down here are storm petrels. And we, so we have leeches storm petrels that nest along the, all along the coast on certain islands where there's at least some soil because they're burrow nesters, right? But it's primarily these larger islands down south where there's enough of um, vegetation and soil on the uh, islands for them to uh, dig their burrows. Uh, for example, Saddle Rock and um, Goat Island, and several, Goat Island is right off of Brookings has a big storm petrol colony. Uh, so the distribution of the birds along the coast has to do with also their um, you know, preferred foraging area, but also nesting habitat. So where you have mostly sea stacks with flat tops or at least some ledges, uh, even though they don't have soil, you're going to get a lot of MERS on those rocks, but you won't get storm petrels. Um, but I, so you do have soil and vegetation, you get storm petrels. You also get some of the other burrow nesting species too, right? Like the, um, the tufty puffins. Um, and then also some of the crevice nesters like uh, the pigeon guillemots and rhinoceros octopus that we'll talk a little bit more about too. Okay, so the other thing to uh, that you have to keep in mind for identifying birds along the coast too is the, the different plumages that they go through. And for, so this is a pigeon guillemot, the alcids, right? One of the, they're in the group of birds with the puffins and the murs, auklets, et cetera. And these are the wing propelled div divers. So they're kind of our, the closest thing we have to uh, penguins here in the Northern Hemisphere. And that's often what people refer to the common birds as, right? Um, and in many respects, despite them not being penguins and the fact that they can fly, they are actually very accomplished divers and in some cases better designed for diving than they are for flying is when you watch them try to lift off the water. Uh, so they are very proficient divers just like penguins are too. Um, so they generally go through uh, two, um, two molts each year or two major plumages, uh, the breeding plumage and the non-breeding plumage. And uh, as opposed to certain uh, gulls, which will go through maybe three or four plumages, um, not within a year, but as they age from young to old. Uh, most of the alcids, you can't tell young birds from old birds, but you can certainly tell breeding birds from non-breeding. And this is a big, good example of the pigeon gill on how strikingly different it can look between the um, summer breeding season and the winter uh, non-breeding season. And this is a good example also of another species where we see them so commonly during the, uh, the breeding season, right? During the summertime, spring, summertime, they're along the rocky headlands nesting in the uh, <coughs> crevices. Uh, but also, they're pretty common in the bays too. So they'll, they'll nest, um, or at least prospect for nests up under uh, some of the docks. Uh, they're common, really common along the bayfront um, and along our docks here at, at ship operations too. Um, but during the winter time, we actually see them very infrequently off, and we're not really sure where they go. Uh, and we're just starting some studies now where we actually can determine uh, where some of these birds are going during the breeding and non-breeding season here along the Oregon coast. And I'll talk a little bit more, more about how we, how we do that. Okay, the, the tough puffin, which is kind of the, another one of those iconic uh, Oregon coast birds too. Uh, the generally, the what we see is during the breeding season up there in the upper left uh, is your classic puffin. That's actually a picture from Alaska. Uh, and then down in the lower right is a non-breeding uh, bird. So they still are puffin-like, but during the uh, winter time they look uh, quite a bit different. And the puff puffins are another one where 
we see them very commonly, or I guess I shouldn't say commonly, occasionally here on the Oregon coast, not as common as they used to be, um, during the summer time, especially around the Haystack Rock up by Cannon Beach and some of the other more common breeding sites. Um, but during the winter time, we just don't see them very often. Even offshore when we're doing our uh, boat surveys, we don't see them very often during the winter time. So they're, they seem to be moving outside the area. Uh, and we're not exactly sure where, like Pigeon Yellow Nuts, where they're going. If they're going north or south, or maybe a little bit of both. One thing that's really uh, interesting uh, and a bit concerning and with the, with the uh, tufted puffins is how the population has declined along the Oregon coast. So this just shows some data from breeding population counts by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service showing in 1979 versus 2008 and just the dramatic drop in uh, the number of breeding birds that they're estimating along the Oregon coast. And, and this isn't just unique to Oregon. Uh, there's a study list uh, noted up there at the top that um, even some, this large colony up out of British Columbia, um, just north of uh, Vancouver Island, where they've also seen an overall long-term reduction in reproductive success and also population. So their populations are declining up there too. And it's, it seems to be more of a range-wide um, effect. Along the Oregon coast, though there haven't been detailed studies to really know why that's occurring, it, it might be to some extent uh, related to the recovery of bald eagles. We certainly see that with the MERS, and I'll talk a little bit more about that along the coast, but also you know, it could be food related to that we really don't know of. But it's certainly concerning, and, and it's, it's definitely a bird of a species of concern for the local uh, um, Oregon and Washington states, too. Okay, and then, and then of course the common birds, right? Which are uh, so common along the coast, and uh, they nest in these high density colonies. Like this is a, a video of um, Yukuna Head. And um, so, as many of you know, uh, the common bird, like many of the alphas, including the uh, puffins, they lay just one egg. So, one large egg each year. So they have the opportunity to raise a maximum of one chick in a given year. So they have these life histories that are much more similar to a, a mammal, like a pinniped. In fact, I, I equate them very, um, in many respects, their life history in terms of life um, lifespan, their uh, reproductive output, their um, and also their uh, age at first reproduction is actually much more similar to a seal or a sea lion than it is to most birds that people are familiar with, especially uh, terrestrial birds. Uh, so these, they don't, uh, many seabirds, including MERS, they don't begin breeding until they're usually a couple years old, um, maybe three years old. In some cases, for some species, it's four or five or more years old. Uh, and they can raise a maximum of one offspring per year. Um, and, and they live up into their teens and maybe into the 20s. And then other seabirds, easily live into their 30s, 40s, or, or even more. Um, so very long-lived and slow to reproduce. The population dynamics of seabirds, especially common MERS, where we actually have the data from these long-term surveys by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to really know what's happening along the coast with these uh, populations. This is a good example of for example, uh, with Yukuna Head versus Gull Rock and Tillamook Rock, where Yukuna Head, the population has increased dramatically over the years, and then it's stabilized to become highly variable. And then I'll zoom in on a couple of these other colonies where they've gone from having as many MERS initially as Yukuna Head did back in the late 80s to being completely abandoned now. And so we've seen this. Uh, very dynamic population shift at some colonies along the Oregon coast. And what it seems like, it's certainly tied with the recovery of the bald eagle uh, during the time that the bald eagle populations were um, suppressed. Then there was protection for the mer colonies, the mer populations, and they increased while the eagle populations were low. Um, and now what we're seeing is to some extent a rebalancing of predators and prey, but we also are uncertain to what extent the eagles are recovering into a population 
or a, a, an ecosystem that's very different than what it might have been before and what alternative food sources may not be available for them that, which they used to have. But this change, it certainly, it seems to be, I don't know if it's a wave, but it's certainly a progression where we saw this effect of the eagles up on the northern <coughs> colonies first, like up by the Columbia River, and then the effect has um, been a lot less down in southern Oregon, but we're starting to see a bit more of the impact here on um, in the central Oregon coast, where, for example, our study at Yukon Head, up until about 2010 or 2011, and the first studies were initiated in 1998, we saw a fair amount of eagle predation there, but it didn't impact the um, reproductive success um, to really dramatically. It certainly impacted, but not, not too dramatically. Uh, but just in the past three, four years, and three years especially, the population, the reproductive output has been extremely low. Maybe about 10% of the birds actually raising a chick, whereas usually it's up around uh, 60 to 80% in a given year. But it's, it's, hovering between 10 and 25 percent in the past few years, mostly because of uh, eagle disruption. Okay, and then of, of course pelicans, which are uh, so uh, common along the coast now. They didn't used to be so common along the Oregon coast, uh, but they're, they're a species that um, we generally start seeing, uh, well there's certain years where we see them year round, but really the population started increasing along the coast uh, in the early summer, right? Because they, the pelicans don't, um, I used to be able to say this, that they don't breed in Oregon until just in recent years, right, where there's been some breeding attempts, some eggs laid up in the Columbia River estuary at East Sand Island. But for the most part, pelicans, uh, they nest and breed down in Southern California and down in Mexico. And then when they, they are breeding pretty early, and then once they finish, like early as in March April, in that time frame. Um, and in May, June, when they start finishing up down south, they start moving north. And uh, so some of the non-breeders and some of the post breeding birds will move north, and that's where we see the big influx during the, uh, the early summer and through the summer. And then into the fall, we get some of the highest numbers of, uh, of Americans, <coughs> especially, again, up in East Sand Island and Columbia River estuary, there can be upwards of you know, 12, 13, 14,000 pelicans that are roosting on that island. Okay, so those are non-breeding birds, but they move up into our area. Here's another example of uh, non-breeding uh, birds that are very common and actually can be very abundant at times along the Oregon coast. So this is, it's, it's a rather small picture uh, up in the upper left-hand corner of the Sooty Shearwater. And for, for you know, many, many decades, uh, we've known about the fact that you know, Sooty Shearwaters have occurred up along in the northern hemisphere along our coast very commonly, um, but they actually breed down here in the southern hemisphere. So here's um, New Zealand, and these are some um, movement tracks from using salt, small micro tracking devices of individuals that were tagged at their breeding colony <coughs> in New Zealand. And so these uh, light colored tracks are during the, the breeding season, so when they're feeding chicks, they're doing central place foraging trips. They head out from the colony, find food, and return. And then you start seeing these uh, more dis the dispersal, the post breeding season, but which marked here by numbers, the number two here. So you see they start moving maybe out toward the coast of uh, South America, Chile, and then start moving north. And they make a pretty directed path across the equator when they're moving both north, moving north and moving south. Uh, and then they head up into the northern hemisphere. So they're, they refer to this as, as in this paper as the Shearwaters tracking the endless summer, right? Because they're breeding during the summertime in the southern hemisphere. Then they move during the summer hemisphere winter up into the northern hemisphere summer. And they, at times, will make this figure eight pattern uh, as they're migrating throughout the entire Pacific. So we end up along the coast of Japan and Russia, over into Alaska, and then along our coast too. And then when they start to head back down south to their um, colony back down in New Zealand, it's quite striking how the, all these birds that were um, tracked over the years, it's usually about a 10 day window that they end up all leaving the northern hemisphere and moving down south 
um, and crossing the equator back into uh, the southern hemisphere. So, and so these shear waters, even although you might not see them so commonly along the shore, they're actually a very abundant bird. In fact, they're at times the most um, abundant seabird along our coast, especially in the fall. Uh, but you certainly will see them on the beaches um, on occasion. And, and it's pretty rare, though, that they do come up into the bays or estuaries in big flocks. Um, like we've had them occasionally here uh, in the Columbia or in the uh, Yukon River estuary, but also in the Columbia River estuary, they occasionally move in there too. But generally, if you're offshore, in boats, you see them a lot, and you end up seeing them on the beaches too. So one thing I wanted to really point out is um, just how. Um, how dynamic the seabird community is along the coast. So this is a chart, this bar chart, that's showing the proportion of birds for a given survey off um, the uh, Columbia River. So just offshore in the ocean of the Columbia River, just to the north Cape Disappointment area. And um, so the main thing to take away from this is that, so this bar, these bars here are common birds, and that makes sense during the summertime, they're extremely abundant, right? But during other times of the year, there's um, other species can be uh, equally or even more abundant. And during the other times of the year, you end up getting a lot of the scoters, grebes, and other uh, birds that aren't common or aren't breeding in, off the Oregon coast during the summertime. So a lot of non-breeders moving into um, Oregon waters. And so, the, the take home message being that the community changes dramatically uh, during the fall, winter, spring versus summer. Okay, so just to go, go over a few, most of you are all familiar with, of course, the common and Pacific loons. We also occasionally get red throated and yellow veil loons, not as commonly though. Um, so, and these are breeding plumage, there's also non breeding plumage, which are much more gray and kind of less, um, more nondescript. Uh, so we'll get uh, loons not too, uh, are fairly frequent along the, uh, on the beaches too. Uh, and then the grebes can be really high. It's amazing if, if you don't, um, in, in some of your bird, wa bird watching activities, in the, um, especially in the fall, found, find a nice headland to look off of and watch the passage of loons, especially in grebes. It's amazing. You can count thousands of them within a matter of uh, 10 minutes, or even without a matter of minutes sometimes. They're, they're um, such high migration rates along the coast. And that includes the western grebes, horn grebes, ear grebes, we get redneck grebes too. Um, so a lot of birds that are from outside the area using, uh, uh, using the Oregon coast waters for foraging and migration paths. And then of course, scoters too, right? So scoters are very abundant along the uh, coast, you know, within, occasionally within the bays you see them scattered about, but the bigger flocks are offshore off along the coast. And, and good places to see these are off of, uh, especially as you're driving in Cape Perpetua. In fact, there's certain areas off of Cape Perpetua where you can see scoters year-round, um, even though they're, they're, of course, not breeding on the, along the coast. But um, during the wintertime and during the migration, you can see big flocks, of especially surf scoters up there in the upper left. So what's pretty unique about those the three groups I just showed you, the scoters, the loons, and the grebes, is that they don't breed in salt water, right? They're all freshwater breeding birds. So those birds are coming from a long ways away. Uh, and, and many of them are, um, I mean, it's not quite as long as the city shear water, but still, they're flying in from some of the tundra areas and the pothole areas up in uh, Canada and Alaska, the um, those regions. So they're migrating down into our waters just to, uh, to feed uh, during, and, and taking up residence in salt water and estuarine brackish water during their non-breeding season. And then another, so a species that you see very commonly on beaches, right, are the northern fulmars. And especially during the fall, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, kind of seasonal cycles in the beach and the birds. Uh, but this is a picture of uh, a northern fulmar up in Alaska. There's both this dark short phase and a light phase. We generally see the light phase, but occasionally, I'm sorry, the dark phase, but occasionally you do see the light phase, which is more of a 
a bright white and a, a lighter gray color. Uh, and so just to give you some information about a little bit of the migration paths of these birds. So as I mentioned, there's actually, other than the shear waters I mentioned, uh, these fulmars, which is a little bit of data, some of the albatrosses that um, we've done some tracking studies on, there's very little data on actually movement paths of the birds through the area. This is a study of um, putting, again, putting small tracking devices on northern fulmars up in the um, Samini Islands of Alaska. So out here in the, uh, kind of along the Alaska Peninsula. And their migration paths, as you can see, primarily through August and uh, October and February, down along the coast into, uh, along British Columbia and in Washington and Oregon and California too. So these birds, they, they are nesting up in Alaska. There's millions of them. They nest in relatively few but very large colonies in Alaska. And uh, they spend a large portion of their winter, their fall and winter down along our coast. And in fact, throughout a lot of the North Pacific, but especially during the, along the California current system, along Oregon, Washington, and California. Um, and so there's been a couple of um, years where there's been a lot of fulmars that ended up on beaches. And um, oftentimes you get a spike in, at least with fulmars, of uh, carcasses on the beaches in the fall, during fall migration. And that partly has to do with the fact that, and this is true for many other species, but it seems to be particular for fulmars, is that in some, some of those wrecks, the, the large kind of die-offs of the uh, fulmars have been um, primarily that hatch year or the first year birds. So these birds that have left the colony, as you can imagine, the first few months are the most difficult time for those birds, those chicks that just have left the colony, need to learn to forage feed for themselves, take care of themselves, that oftentimes those, um, that coupled with the kind of first fall storms, winter storms, uh, end up with, we end up with a fair number of birds on the beaches. And that's certainly the case with full marks at times. Okay, so why, is, why else do birds end up on the beach? Uh, here's a good, a good photograph of what we uh, commonly see at Yukonet Head with the eagles um, hunting the mer colony there. So here's a bald eagle that can come in to take an adult murder. And, and in general, uh, the impact isn't that great as long as the adult eagle takes just maybe one or two murders and flies off and doesn't spend a lot of time on the colony. What we end up with in terms of more uh, mortality and carcasses in the water, carcasses on the beach, is when the eagle spends more time on the colony, especially when they're chicks. Um, on, on colony, and then those chicks um, are left unattended, um, and then they end up dying. Uh, so, and it's not just eagles. Sometimes we have this situation with pelicans. And so here's an example of a juvenile pelican grabbing a bird chick and shaking it, and you can see it, the chick just regurgitated the fish, and the pelican ate the fish. Oh. <laughs> and, which is a bit strange to me. <laughs> It seems like a difficult way to get a, uh, to get a fish. <laughs> but I'll show you that again. So here, here it's picking through these chicks. And these chicks are just before they're ready to fledge. So it's shaking that chick. The chick, and then there's the fish. <laughs> Which we were really surprised to see this. Unfortunately, we did see situations where the pelican actually ate the chick, too. Uh, but, uh, but in this situation, it's, we've seen this happen several times. And uh, in one year, it was incredibly uh, damaging, um, destructive to the colony because there is, and it's primarily these young uh, pelicans. So we're not exactly sure why they do this. And some of, some of this kind of circumstantial evidence makes me feel like, seem like they're actually having a hard time finding food. Um, but also, there's times where the pelicans are just roosting on the colony, and they'll, they'll spend um, actually long periods of time on the colony, 
uh, the Murus will get used to them being there and gather back around the pelicans, but then the pelican stands up and the Murus scatter. Um, and they don't, and the pelicans never chase the chicks, but then there's times when they actually do uh, chase the chicks. Uh, but what happened in this situation um, was these, these groups of young pelicans ended up on the beaches and then just stayed, or I'm sorry, um, ended up on colony, and they just harassed these mer chicks and they chased all the adults off the colony, and then it was raining that night and the next day, and the mer chicks were left unattended. And uh, we ended up with, within a, several, a couple days, there was over 300 mer carcasses, uh, chick carcasses on the beaches scattered between Yuquinahead and the North Jet. Um, and this was just a gathering of some of those, uh, some of those carcasses that washed up on the beach. Question. Question. Yeah. I, I'm guessing the answer is no. Do mers ever engage in mobbing behavior? No. No. They, they'll try to protect a chick and an egg. And it's pretty impressive at times how close they'll stay and how long they'll stay before they actually leave. And at times they stay too long. And it's just getting, one mer trying to. Usually, stand yeah, yeah. The the mer, you know, the, the, so the, the goals are uh, both uh, positive and negative. You know, kind of a, the double edged sword. For the mers, the goals mob the eagles constantly. And so usually that's their first sign of an incoming eagle is you hear the gulls calling. Um, but so the, the gulls will harass the eagle and chase the eagle away. But if the eagle disrupts the colony and exposes eggs and, eggs and chicks, the gulls will take advantage and eat the eggs and chicks too. But the mers don't. They, you know, they can try to defend uh, their eggs or their chick on colony, but in the air, they, they have to fly kind of like a torpedo. You know, they, they can't weave and, and climb and dive after it. Eagle like a uh, adult. Yeah. Okay, so why? So that's it's one of the reasons why birds and other birds end up on the beach is because of predators. Another reason, of course, is marine debris. And here's a picture of a, a mer on Cobble Beach that has um, some fishing line and a sinker wrapped around it. And then oh, here's a storm petrel. Actually, it's on a beach in Hawaii, but it has some netting that it's wrapped up in. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about these beach bird surveys and what kind of information um, can be obtained from them. And actually, there can be some pretty uh, valuable contributions to these beach bird that these beach bird surveys make. So here's a, an example of a paper that was written um, and published in Marine Ecology Progress Series by uh, a variety of people who are involved in um, carcass. Uh, carcass surveys along the beaches, um, including Julia Parrish with the Coast Program up at University of Washington, and Bob Luffles, long-term um, seabird um, or carcass surveys here along on the Oregon coast, and then beachcombers down out of Monterey with Hound and Evans. So using all these beach segments along the coast, they can look at patterns of um, carcass deposition rates over the years. Um, and to see that what, what is that related to in terms of environmental um, variability or winds, sea conditions, etc. Um, so we can look at some of these long-term trends and see, so for example, here's common MERS and then also Brands Cormorants, and then this is month, but so November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. So um, summertime and then uh, end of winter and beginning of winter. And you can see these are for just different areas, northern Washington, southern Washington, Newport, Oregon, and Monterey Bay, California. And a positive, the, the bar is going up means that it's a positive increase in the number of carcasses. Bar is going down means that there's fewer carcasses relative to the long-term mean. Um, so you can see a lot of variability and you often see how, for example, with common MERS, we get more of a spike in, during the summer time, right? And, and this is lumping adults and chicks too, but that makes sense that we get these spikes during the summer and early fall uh, during the breeding season and then le less so in the fall, and, or in, yeah, it's the fall migration. And the same is true for some of the breeding birds here, like uh, also with the cormorants, right? But you see some different patterns uh, in the different regions. And then, you see very different patterns with some of the other species, like for example, rhinoceros oxa, 
rhinoceros oplets and Cassin's oplets, where you see uh, quite a bit of spikes here in, during the winter period and, uh, and, not, and fewer during the summer. Um, same is true for Cassin's oplets too, and that's because these are species that are moving, they don't nest as abundantly along some of our coasts, but move into our area from um, other more abundant uh, nesting areas like further north, maybe British Columbia or Alaska. And so you see these patterns, and I should just point out too that this, this study also showed that it was indeed a lot of environmental variability that impacted what, how many carcasses were on the beach, more so than um, in terms of wind patterns or current patterns. It was more a, a matter of potentially food availability. Um, but the wind and current patterns certainly uh, impact the birds too. So you also hear, hear a lot about uh, harm, harmful algal blooms. So birds can end up um, being affected by biotoxins in their food sources. And that can cause mortality from um, the, the toxins. But also there's situations here, for example, where this one dinoflagellate ended up uh, causing um, protein uh, product or the proteins that were broken up and from that um, dinoflagellate and incorporated into the sea foam worked like um, a surfactant in dissolving and removing oil from the bird's feathers. So they lost protection from, uh, from oils in their feathers and ended up with hypothermia. So you have both acute toxic effects, but also in this case it was uh, birds dying from hypothermia. And then I just wanted to mention a little bit about, uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion about marine reserves. Um, so this is, you know, we don't have a lot of data for birds in marine reserves along the west coast, but we can have some information about um, a sample, a study specimen, or a study group down in South Africa, where there's been some interesting studies of looking at penguin foraging and um, fisheries exclusions within uh, their foraging range. So here's an example of these uh, South African penguins. And this just shows these, it's a little bit blurry, sorry about that, these two colonies. And then this circle right here is an area that fishing was excluded. And this year fishing was not excluded. And then this year fishing was excluded within this circle. And then within this colony there was no exclusion. And you can see that one thing is that this is the foraging range of these uh, penguins. It contracted considerably from this year to this year when there was no fishing within this radius. And also that um, the penguins decreased their foraging effort by 30% during the, in the area um, or in the year when this exclusion occurred. Uh, so this is some strong evidence to show us that in some cases these um, marine reserves can directly impact um, the, uh, the seabirds that are within them. At least in a situation where the birds are foraging on the same species that the fishery is going after. And that's certainly not always the case, and it's not that, um, generally the case here along the Oregon coast. Um, for example, we don't really have targeted fisheries, at least in our marine reserves, like for example, you have the Petro Marine Reserve that's targeting forage fish, right? They're, they're targeting the other species. Um, but also keeping in mind that um, whether these marine reserves are going to uh, the effective for marine birds really depends on, just like any other marine organism, organism what is the full range of that, um, that that bird uses during the breeding season and the non-breeding season. So there's some species, for example, pigeon guillemots uh, and cormorants that forage relatively close to shore, that some of these smaller uh, sanctuaries are going to be, should hopefully have a positive impact on. But then there's other species, like common hers, uh, that they forage quite a ways out to sea. So if the reserve is only a matter of uh, you know, three miles from the beach, the birds are foraging much further beyond that. Uh, so the, the potential in effect of a, a reserve site really de is um, dependent upon the bird's natural history. Uh, so I guess just overall in, in summary um, that uh, there's a really diverse range of birds along the Oregon coast, and really diverse range of natural histories, too. Um, and, and so that's really going to impact what birds you end up seeing on the beaches 
either dead or alive too, especially those of you who are bird watchers see how, how that species fluctuate um, throughout the year. Um, but it's, it's a combination of their natural history during the breeding season and also during the non-breeding season that's really going to affect, affect who, what birds you're seeing, which time of the year on the different beaches. So I guess it's, if there's any time for questions, I'll help you come back, so I'm happy to answer additional questions. Yep. So Bill, is there still time? To yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Yeah. I have a question about uh, kind of the patchiness uh, of birds on the beach. Yeah. Washed up birds. And right. I'm talking about non-breeders, say, this fall, kind of how you mentioned with from Mars. It could be Cassin's Auckland or something. Say you're walking, you just pick up flakes on the beach and you walk a mile and you say, I see 10 of each. Well, then if I extrapolate that, I'm soon into some pretty high, if I extrapolate, say, the whole Oregon coast, I'm into some pretty big numbers. And I was just wondering if you could give me some perspective on just as a naturalist doing that, how, how can I think about what I see on just a random stretch of beach that I pick on a certain day and I, you know, when I look at the tally? Right. Right, so in terms of what what are the variables yeah, that are affecting that? Ask, um, actually, because you study this a lot, is, yep. is it a more of a, of a just a uniform distribution, or how do I think about patchiness? It's very question. patchy. Yeah, so even the, even carcass deposition along the beaches is, is very patchy. So, and a lot of that has to do with um, you know as uh, that large longer term study indicated that these. The general magnitude of the number of carcasses that hit the beach over time is certainly more uh, has, is better explained by environmental conditions, environmental variability. But the actual occurrence of those um, carcasses on different portions of the beach in space rather than time is really dependent on um, current patterns and wave patterns. So, for a good example of that is um, just between, for example, you point ahead. And then this, um, and the jetties up here along the coast. The, there are times when we're doing uh, carcass walks um, because we collect tissue samples from the merchants actually when they hit the beach. And there's lots of times where we see carcasses at, aggregated just south of the headland. Like maybe there's an eddy being formed by the southward flowing current, and there's an eddy formed, and they get it circulates back up along the beach, and we see we get lots of carcasses along. Um, along Agate Beach, just south of the headland, and then there's years where uh, we don't see, we see so few mer carcasses there, and all the mer carcasses that we end up collecting from Yukon Head that aren't right at Yukon Head on Cowell Beach are down closer to the North Jet, and um, and then there's times where we see actually we see very few carcasses uh, south of the North Jet. So usually most of those, and we see very few to the north. So you know it really varies pretty dramatically in space, depending on the, the currents and the topographic features along the shoreline. Yeah. So yeah, definitely it's not uniform. You, 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 don't extra, you can't extrapolate out. Yeah. You talked a little bit about um, how specialized some of these environments are for like the tuft and puff and whatnot. And right. Having, because you know that space is at a premium, and then also you have other species coming into the area like the pelican, which seems to kind of generalize where it hangs out. And, you know, we, it, can you speak a little bit to the competitiveness of these influx of new species that weren't here before, and how that, like a pelican, I imagine, might eat more fish than a, a tufted puffin, and that could also deplete their stock of fish to fish from. Can you talk a little bit about that interaction with competition between these changing population dynamics? So uh, competition uh, in terms of for feet, like for food for resources for for, for like yes. space both space. both okay yeah so it, that both competition certainly exists both for nesting space and for um, and also for at, in, in the foraging you know in foraging blocks foraging conditions too um, you know to I don't think to a lot at least looking at the the spatial distribution at sea of a lot of these birds. I don't, I certainly, along the coastline, I don't see where even these big groups of pelicans, I really, I see very few of them um, foraging along, offshore along the coast. You know, you see them foraging near shore, you see them foraging a lot in the estuaries, especially, you know, certainly to a large extent in the Columbia River estuary too, but once we get a little bit 
uh, further offshore, we see big flocks of, um, you know, the, the MERS, the um, auklets, and gulls, and other species, and we see very little pelican foraging. So I think, I don't think there's much competition with pelicans. Uh, pelicans are pretty specialized in, in what they eat. You know, certainly a lot of um, shallow schooling forage fishes, anchovies, etc. Those are really proficient fibers. And, um, and the pelicans just aren't as common to get a little ways from the shoreline. Uh, and then on, on the colonies, though, there is definitely competition for nest space. And, uh, and you know, it's a, generally what you see are the, um, and this is from studies along this coast, because we don't have a, a marked population of known age birds, but often what you see is that the older, more experienced breeders arrive first and um, are more synchronous in their nesting, so that, and they generally are going to take some of the uh, higher quality nest sites, maybe in the middle of the colony. Um, and, um, and then usually the, the younger birds or the more inexperienced breeders will fill in um, the kind of the perimeter. Uh, or maybe those younger birds we often see are the ones who are prospecting new sites too. So uh, a lot of the seabirds are primarily um, site faithful. Once they establish a nest, they generally do not uh, move to another site in the next year. They usually return to that same site. Um, and it's only under um, you know, kind of extreme conditions of consistent failure or um, for some reason uh, that, you know, from, predate, from predation or other reasons that they end up moving to a new site. Um, some species move more so than others. Um, for example, terns, right, Caspian terns, they, they nest on low-lying river bars and they often, they'll move around a lot. And Arctic terns, Aleutian terns, they, they'll move very frequently. But common birds, albatrosses in particular, move very, very little. Um, but then there's also, so there's competition within the species, there's also competition between species, especially for the burrow nesting species. They'll definitely, one, you know, one species might be more aggressive and uh, like rhinoceros, auklets versus tough puffins. If they're co-occurring uh, in the same breeding site, there'll be a lot of competition between between them. And we do see, in some cases, larger colonies having, uh, those birds having larger foraging ranges, indicating that there is some competition for food uh, feeding at sea, too. The, the foraging flocks are highly competitive, for sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, in the years involved in the Dead Bird Survey, we, we would find tufted puffins fairly often, but occasionally we'd find horned puffins. Oh, right. And I just wondered what's the theory about how they get there since they don't breed on the Oregon coast. Right, so the, right, the tufted puffins breed up to the, the north of us, primarily up in Alaska. And, uh, or I'm sorry, the horned puffins, um, primarily up in Alaska. But they do occasionally migrate south during the winter time. And it's usually, it's, it's interesting, during certain years, you'll see, you'll end up with getting more of the horned puffin sites than others. Um, but usually it's the, when we see them on the beach, it's during the migration period, not so much during the summer. Yeah, and I think there's certain times of the year or certain conditions cause them to be pushed further south during migration, whether they're looking for food or just the way the storm patterns are bringing them further south. Yeah. So what extent is that huge drop in puffin numbers due to displacement to other places besides Oregon versus just uh, overall drop in their numbers? Yeah, that, that's an important question that hasn't been addressed. And, and that's one of the, you know, the, the interest in potentially uh, listing, you know, an endangered species listing or for a distinct population segment of the tufted puffin. I think that it's been, cons it, it hasn't been proposed, but it's been discussed. But that's one of the key questions to be addressed is, are, has the population declined, or is it just shifted north, you know, bringing more up in Alaska, et cetera? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, Oregon Shores has been involved with other organizations in promoting uh, better conservation of forage fish. Right. And um, as part of that effort, I've been looking closely at some of the fisheries in Oregon to understand what the fishery, fisheries are. And in particular, when you point out that common deer drop-off uh, near, uh, near here, um, 
if you look at the same graph of the Pacific herring, when, when you hit 2003, it just flattens out too. And there used to be this Pacific herring uh, row fishery right. here in Yakima Bay, and it hasn't. There has been no fishery here since 2003. Was the last fishery. I was wondering if those might somehow be related. I I don't know if they're related or not, but that's something that definitely should be considered. And because herring are a really uh, important forage fish in, along this coast and in lots of other areas too. And, um, and it's, been, it's interesting because there are, at the Quinn Head too, we see uh, herring as uh, at times pretty regular in the diet. And it hasn't been nearly as common as it has um, in years past. The past, the past three years, generally what we see, at, and I didn't show any of the data, but at the Aquinnah Head, the MERS are eating primarily uh, smelts and sand lance and herring. And uh, there's a variety of other species that they eat, but the three major ones that usually make up you know, 80% or more of the diet in combination are those three. And there's some years where herring dominates, other years where sand lance dominates, other years where smelt dominates. And there's some years where they're relatively equal for proportion, maybe 30% each. Um, but, uh, and we see this pattern with warm and cold water. Like sand lamps, when we see, when we have cold water conditions off the coast, we see it definitely much more sand lamps in the diet. Um, but we've seen the past few years have just been smelt dominated. And um, we're, what part of what we're interested in looking into is, is that, um, you know, what is the cause, what's causing, uh, is smelt a preferred food or is it a, a a less preferred food that they're um, forced to take because they don't have better options. Um, and we don't have answers to those, to those questions yet. But there, there's no doubt, and I'm saying this mostly from other studies where I've seen, for example, have been involved with up in Alaska where herring are just key uh, prey items because of their schooling behavior, their high energy content, that uh, uh, crashes in herring fisheries um, and herring populations have caused pretty dramatic impacts on, on the um, forage fish predators. Um, let me wrap up with a question of my own. Yeah. Um, with regard to the uh, interactions between um, uh, eagles and, and MERS, uh, as you, you were saying, a, a significant portion of the impact isn't the eagle taking the MER right. and eating it, it's, it's just the, uh, the disturbance. I'm just curious, I mean, is that a very common thing ecologically where, where one species has a significant impact on the population of another through what's essentially like collateral damage? Is that? Oh, right. It, you know, it, it isn't real common, but it certainly occurs. And there's actually been quite a bit of research into this. I think it's, of course, much more dramatic for a colonial or group nesting species, right? Um, I mean, you can certainly see where, um, in, in this case, in a colonial nesting species, then once a predator comes in and, and just disturbs the colony, there's, there's just so much opportunity for secondary predators to come in and forage. Um, but this could also be a case of where, you know, for example, if there's um, maybe groups uh, spawning for um, fish or for squids or for other other situations where maybe that um, the egg masses are protected and one predator moves in. And then there's all these secondary predators that can come in and, and, and gobble up egg masses too. Um, but there's also been, it's, it's not exactly the same, but these other related uh, kind of, I guess, effects of predators where, for example, the re uh, I think a lot of what we see with the eagles and the MERS, it, it, to some extent, can be equated with the return of wolves on, into the landscape, right? And how that's affecting the um, ungulate populations, the elk and the deer, et cetera, and the same is true with cougar in this area. Um, but so the, there's this kind of indirect effect on the prey too, in that they might be displaced from certain foraging areas because of just fear of going into that, um, uh, those areas. So for example, for in the case of wolves or cougars and deer or elk, they, those animals might be restricted to more uh, kind of sheltered, uh, less optimum grazing areas rather than wide open fields because they're trying to avoid the predators. So there's kind of two things going on with indirect secondary predators coming in and then also just maybe avoidance of um, key feeds.